Bible says in 1 John in chapter 2, beginning with verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful this morning. So grateful, Father, that we can be here. Father, we're grateful for the time that we have spent together already in a way that we would worship you, that we would lift our voices in praise, and Father, that we could meet around the Lord's table to remember what Jesus Christ did for us, to redeem us, to give us a home in heaven one day. Father, we are grateful for the message, the message in song that reminds us of our blessings and how they overflow in our life. Father, may we be mindful of all the promises, all the provisions, all that you do for us in a world that is filled with so much discouragement and defeat. Father, may we focus on you this morning. May we lift you up as we preach. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When you look at that verse of Scripture this morning that is in our text, we realize that is a strong, and I mean strong, indictment. We need to seriously consider the word that we have this morning. Listen to me. Love. Love is the very essence of life when directed by God's will. Amen. I'll let that sink in. It is also the cause of death and destruction when misdirected. So I ask you this morning, what do you love? What is that that is most important in your life this morning? How do you pour out your love? The Bible says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh. Lust is, a, is best defined as an over-desire. We talk about a strong desire. It is not only a strong desire, but it is an over-desire. We have natural desires that God has given us. Yeah. They're normal. It's the way God made us. But what happens when there is an over-desire and our desires get out of control? The Bible says... In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Listen to this. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When the lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Death. The Bible says in John 10, 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Satan's plan of destruction is to come between you and God. Yes, amen. But that's Boy, you're gonna, we're going to get something here this morning. Satan wants to wean you away from God. Satan's scheme is diametrically opposed to God's scheme. You see, he has a, a three-point scheme of damnation. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, 
You know this as well as I do if you've studied anything. This lines up with the nature of the old devil. This epitomizes who the devil is. When you start talking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Notice this. Pay attention. Satan works from the outside to the inside. But God works from the inside to the outside. God changed your heart. Once he changes your heart, he changes what? Your behavior, the way you live your life. Satan, he wants to destroy you. God wants to give you life. God wants to bring joy into your life. God wants to give you something that is strong and something that is powerful. Something will help you move through this life and walk in victory. Amen. May I remind you that when you come to Jesus, you come just as you are. But let me remind you also that Jesus loves you too much to leave you that way. Amen. Oh, we got to hear this. What's it say in 2 Corinthians 6, 17? Wherefore, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. What's the Bible say in Hebrews in chapter 12? If you'll notice there in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Wherefore, see, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hear what the word of God <laughs> is saying to us today as it speaks to us. The old song says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. If you look in the, in the book of Colossians there, in chapter 3, I want you to notice something that is very important to this message. <laughs> it says, if he then be risen with Christ. That's talking about you. You remember when you were risen? You were raised to walk in the universe of life. If he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ <laughs> sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your what? Affection on things above, not on the things of the earth, for we are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And then verse 4 really brings it home. When Christ, who is our life, is Jesus your life this morning, Amen. shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Are you looking forward to that, Christian? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Are we looking forward to that, the promise that God has given us? In verse 16 of our text, I want you to notice again what the Bible says. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. This is the strategy that that's, uh, Satan used in the garden. This is the strategy that he used in the wilderness with Jesus. And this is the method that he uses to destroy mankind. First of all, consider with me Adam and Eve. You know, if you go back and you read chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, and I'm not going to do that right now, but if you did, everything is pure perfection. I mean, man was innocent. He had fellowship with God. I mean, things were going well. No question about it. And then in chapter 3, the old devil shows up. He rears his ugly head. You know, I suppose it can be said that chapter 3, we find the most pivotal book in the Bible. The most pivotal scripture in the Bible. Because it is the account of the fall of man. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's important. That's what it happened. But then you look at chapters 4 through 11, and you will find a tremendous vacuum. 
There's a need to be filled. A void. There's a dark cloud hovering over because something happened. Because we begin to read in the fourth chapter forward about what? About jealousy. About anger. About bloodshed, murder, lying, wickedness, corruption, rebellion, and judgment. Now, where did that come from? Where did that come from? I mean, everything was pure perfection. And then all of a sudden, we see this dark cloud. In Genesis, in chapter 3, beginning there in verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Here it goes. Here it goes. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat at it of it, neither shall ye what? Touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, They shall not surely die. Ye shall not die. Well, here he goes. For God, now pay attention to this, doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your what will be open? Your eyes. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, you know what happened? She succumbed to his temptation. She gets her husband involved. And then you begin to read in verse 6. And then you read in verse 7. And their eyes were open. They realized they were naked. So they, they, they uh, sew together fig leaves as a covering to cover themselves up. And then in verse 8, they hear the voice of God walking in the garden. And verse 9, God calls unto Adam. And he says, where art thou? <coughs> it's the story of the fall of man. What happened there? I'll tell you what happened. If you'll notice this, Satan pulled out his three-point scheme of destruction. They saw that the, that was good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. They, they saw it was pleasant to the eye. That's the lust of the eye. And then there was a desire to be wise, wasn't it? Yeah. And that's the pride of life. They touched that one thing. You know, it was just one thing. God said, oh, I don't know, I'm asking this why. You're loving obedience, and I want that played out in the fact that you do not touch that one thing. Just one thing. Not a dozen things, not two things. Just one thing. And the devil gets involved in what they do. They disobey God. And death enters in. And now it passes upon all men. In verse 7, they try to cover up their sin. Are you listening to me? Now, brother, I can stop right here and start preaching again. On an, oh, oh, listen to this. They tried to cover up their sin. Adam and Eve did not confess their sin. They tried to cover it up. And in verse 19, God called out unto Adam. And he said, where art thou? Why did he call out them? I'm going to tell you why. Because they were lost. Yeah. Listen to what I'm saying this morning. They were L-O-S-T. They were lost. Yeah. Because of their sin. Man today is often lost because of his sin. He's separated from God. Just like Adam and Eve were separated from God. They were not pursuing God. God had to pursue them because they were lost. Let's talk about somebody else. Let's talk about David. King David, because God made him king. You think about his life. Oh, a magnificent life. King David. Man, I'm telling you what, God made him king. And think about all that happened with David and how he, he was able to defeat the, the, the giant Goliath with just a few uh, smooth stones and, and bring victory and how the people would sing about how Saul has slain thousands but David has slain ten thousands and all that David had done. How he had lived 
in such a, a victorious life and how things were going good for David and how he was leading his, his men to victory. He was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. But then one day, the Bible says he walks out on that balcony and he sees and all of a sudden, he begins to lust. And what happened? You know what happened? It's the very same thing. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. As Satan pulled out his three-point plan of destruction on David, David buys into it. He, he commits adultery with Bathsheba. Not only is there adultery, but there is murder as he has her husband Uriah murdered. And then what happens? As his life is broken and begins to fall apart. What happens? If you begin to look at the life of David and how that David would lose that baby, you remember that? He would lose that child. Remember what David said? I cannot bring him back. But there was another death. It was the death of his rebellious son, Absalom, who would die in battle, who rebelled against his father. But there's more, isn't there? Do you remember the day? David had a goal. David had a dream. He wanted to build that temple. But the day would come when the man of God would come and say, Thou art the man. You will not build that temple. Why? Because you're a man of blood and war. Satan. Satan had launched his attack against him. <coughs> but then, but then we hear, we hear the heart cry of David. He says, have mercy upon me. Oh God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Oh, listen to David as he cries out for redemption. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge, unlike Adam and Eve, he said, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. I'm not going to lie about it and stay in sin. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And then he said in verse 11, Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free. Spirit. We read another story, yet another story about yet another man, a strong man by the name of Samson. We notice the steps of his demise. But before we notice the steps of his demise, we notice a man that is so strong that he can carry the gate of Gaza on his shoulder, on his back. A man who could take the jawbone of a donkey and, and he could kill the Philistines. Numbers and numbers and great numbers of Philistines. And all that he would accomplish, how he was strong, because God made him strong. But remember, he had a vow with God. You know what a vow is? That's what you took when you became a Christian. A vow of faithfulness and love and obedience. He took a vow. But what happened? Satan showed up. Satan pulled out his three-point plan of destruction, didn't he? He ran into a woman by the name of Delilah. The Bible cried out against that relationship, but yet he pursued Delilah because of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And what happened to him? You know what happened to him? She would say, tell me, Samson, if you love me. Did you hear that? If you love me. Where was his love? Each time he would, he would tell her something, he'd get a little closer to the truth, but he would lie. 
And then she would say, Samson, wake up. The Philistines are here. And he'd jump up and he would defeat him. He would beat him. And then the second time, just like the first time. But then she said, oh, Satan, if you, or Satan, yeah. Samson, if you love me, you tell me. And he broke his vow with God. Mm. And would wake up the last time strong. Samson, the Philistines, they rush in. They apprehend him. They take him, they beat him, they blind him, they make a slave out of him. Satan defeated him. And there he was, grinding in the mill. He lost his strength. He was broken. He was broken. But much like David, he began to cry out to God again. He began to cry out, oh God, allow me to vindicate you. He repented. He confessed to God. <clears throat> and God honored him. And he was strong again. And one last time, he told that boy when he walked out there that day, he said, take my hand and place it. And with a mighty heat, he brought that structure down. The Bible says he, he killed more Philistines in his death than he ever did in his life. Why? Because he came back to God. He came back to God. Once again, he was in the will of God. May I suggest something to you? That when people become self-absorbed, It leads to self-destruction. When it becomes all about you and we forget about God, our life is going down the wrong road and it will lead to destruction. The Bible said, if any man will come after me, this is what Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What's the Bible say in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6? It's there that we find these words. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? Ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Remember the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? He wanted eternal life. I said he was a rich young ruler. It sounds like he had it all. Well, I suppose he did have most of it. Almost everything. So he asked Jesus about eternal life, and what did Jesus say? He said, keep the commandments. We remember the commandments. <laughs> what was his response? He said, well, I've done that from my youth up. So he was a rich, young man, a young ruler. He had youth. He had power. He had money. And apparently, he had some morality. And so Jesus said to him, he said, all right. Then take all that you have and sell it. And give to the poor. What happened? He turned and he walks away in defeat. Let me tell you something. He did what a lot of people do today. I want you to get this. He refused to be sold out for Christ, lock, stock, and barrel. I'm going to tell you something. This isn't something part-time. This isn't something that we play with. This isn't something that we do a few days a week. This is full-time all the time. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Amen. He is either first place or he is last place or no place in your life. When you become a Christian, you give your entire life. You surrender. You surrender to him. His lust for his passion or possessions, his lust for the world was stronger than his love for the Lord and love for eternal life. I was talking to a girl one day and she told me about her childhood and it was riddled with addiction, immorality, adultery, you name it. You name it. She, she had just, her life was just in, in, in great disarray. As we were talking, she mentioned something to me and here's what she said. 
She said, you know, she said, when I was just a little girl, you know what my daddy told me? And I said, I had no idea. She said, he told me that he loved his heroin more than he loved me. She said, it destroyed me. It broke me. You know what that's a picture of? Of sin and Satan. How he destroys lives. Consider Jesus' encounter with Satan. Right after his baptism, again, Satan reaches down into his arsenal. He pulls out his three-point strategy. In Matthew chapter 4, he's trying to get Jesus to come to what? The lust of the flesh. In verse 6, the lust of the eyes. In verses 8 and 9, the pride of life. But Jesus didn't bite. There was no side roads or shortcuts for Jesus. He was not going to get outside of his Father's will. There was no sensationalism. The only escape was going to be the cross. Jesus was not going to pull a rabbit out of the hat and saw a lady in two. There was not going to be any magic tricks. He was going to do it God's way. And only God's way. There was no bargaining with the devil. He was not going to give in or give up. But there was no thought of worshiping the devil. You recall why the devil was kicked out of God's economy? I mentioned this earlier. You know why he was kicked out in the first place? Because he wanted to be God. People today sell their soul to the devil in exchange for what? This present world. Oh, I'm just going to give in. I'm just going to live anyway. I'm going to disregard God or what Jesus did on the cross. The hope that we have through Christ. I'm going to disregard all that. That doesn't matter to me. So they sell their soul to the devil. There was a college boy who wanted it. He wanted it all. He wanted everything the world had to offer. It just so happened that this young man was a mathematical whiz, a genius. But he would ignore God. There was no place in that boy's life for God. It just so happened he had a roommate that was a Christian. This boy wouldn't give up. He would try to witness to him. He tried to show him Jesus in the way that he lived. But yet he, this, man, this young man refused to listen. Finally, one day he did this. He said to him, he said, you know, he said, you are the smartest guy I know. Man, he said, you know math better than anybody. So I've got this equation, and I want to see if you can figure it out. And he wrote it down on a piece of paper, and he walked out of the room. And so this math quiz, this mathematical genius, he opens up this piece of paper and read the equation that said, what profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? Amen. Why would we ever want to give in to the devil? Jesus wasn't buying what the devil was selling. And Jesus used the sword of the Spirit to cut him to shreds. The same word that God has given us, the same scripture that God has given us, that we use when Satan comes knocking, we use this, the word of God. Finally, consider this, Satan's attempt to destroy our life. Come in, said the spider to the fly, dangling the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life before us. That over-desire when something becomes in control of our life. It was Bathsheba with David, Delilah with Samson. It was Sodom with Lot. What will it be in our life? They got what they wanted, but they lost everything they had to get it. And that is always the case. Years ago, I was working for a Kenlet Coal Company when I was in my 20s. I'll never forget this. The boys were talking about a classmate of theirs. And they said, you know, he used to always tell us, old Larry, he, he would say, boys, he said, I'm not going to live my life mining coal, <laughs> working like a, I don't know what, you just watch me, boys. Watch what I do. 
I'm going to go out and I'm going to make a lot of money. And you know he did exactly what he, he said. He sure did. Old Larry went out and he became a, a founder. He became a publisher of one of the dirtiest, low-down, smuttiest magazines that ever hit the school of dawn. That's right. Let me ask you a question. How did it work out for him? Being wheeled around in that wheelchair because he was paralyzed because someone shot him and tried to kill him. How did it work out with him when his wife died of AIDS? How did it work out because he totally disregarded God and morality? He allowed Satan to devour him and eat him up and destroy him and to use him to impact other people with his dirty, rotten pornography. How did it work out for him? It didn't work out for him. He destroyed him and destroyed others. Much like the old farmer with the bumper crop who had no thought for God. He just wanted to build bigger barns. He just wanted more. And God said to him, you fool, your soul will be required of you this night. Where is God in our life? I want to tell you something this morning. God's way is a way of hope. God's way is a way of victory. God's way is a way of eternal life. You know, we have a lot of questions. We have a lot of concerns in our life. Oftentimes our life is riddled and broken. And, and I'm telling you what, but the world will not fix you. The world has no bond for you. There's no way the world can help you. But Jesus Christ, the great physician, can give you hope. Amen. Something that nobody can take away from you. Amen. I promise you this morning, the devil can do all he wants to do, but he cannot have your salvation unless you give it to him. Unless you turn your back on God. He cannot take that away from you because the Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What about you this morning? God loves you. God loves you and God wants you to come to him. Now listen to me. And put your faith in him. Trust him. Believe in him. He wants you to repent. You're going to make a U-turn. You're going to live for him. You're going to love God. He's going to be the focus of your affection and your love and your attention 24-7. And you're going to confess Jesus before men. And then we'll baptize you in that watery grave just like they did in the Bible. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Folks, the reason I tell you this is you can have everything in the world if you don't have Jesus. But it comes down to the final analysis when the smoke clears and the day is done. The only thing that matters is how things between you and Jesus. That's all that matters. So I ask you this morning do you love God? Do you love Him more than anything in the world? Because that's all that matters. And He will not fail you. Let's stand as we sing our invitation.